All right, shall we begin? Let's do it. My name is David Sankel. Uh, I work at Bloomberg. I'm the, the TL for our, our core microservice architecture. Um, that's enough about me. You know what the talk is about. Uh, I'm just curious, how many of you feel like you know the difference between a programmer and an engineer? Raise your hand. OK, cool. How many of you would consider yourselves predominantly a programmer and not an engineer? OK, like a few of you. Cool. So this is a philosophical talk. And uh, I don't, I've never really done a philosophical talk before. Um, I hope that I can do it justice. There's, there's an important insight that comes later on. Uh, but we'll give it a try. But just to give you an idea of like questions that we want to be able to answer. Uh, so why do so many successful projects have such bad code? That question comes up frequently. Um, why is Agile by the book so rare? What makes for a good API? Why is C++ still so popular for 30 years? Uh, why hasn't functional programming taken off? Why do so many programmers avoid the standard template library? Why do so many programmers do non-programming tests? Um, all this kind of stuff. So in order to be able to answer these questions and to kind of like build up this philosophy, we're going to talk about things that we don't normally talk about in, uh, in this kind of conference. So let's talk about alcohol. What? So <laughs> let's talk about these two guys in alcohol. So this guy is uh, Antonio Rodriguez. He's standing next to Joaquin Solano. And these guys are very, very much tied to alcohol. And it's not because they drink it, although who doesn't like to drink alcohol? Well, many people. But, but anyway, these are chemical engineers. And this right here is a Zucarera Montero. So this is a, um, a plant that's on the southern coast of Spain. And what it does is it makes alcohol. Um, so uh, they generally produce uh, high-grade ethanol. So ethanol, like 99% uh, ethanol. So you use this kind of ethanol for, I don't know, all kinds of stuff. You can add it into wine if, if your wine is not very good quality and you need to get, add some more alcohol to it. Uh, you can use it for fuel. There's all kinds of things that you can do with it. Uh, and one of the byproducts of this creation of alcohol process is this thing called aguardiente. It has an English word. I don't know what it is. Uh, but this aguardiente is what's used in creation of rum. So that's what you saw on the prior slide there. So why are we talking about alcohol? Why are we talking about chemical engineering? So the idea is to see if we can gain some insights from these other engineering fields, which are way more established, have lived for a lot longer than software engineering. So think of this plant as their code base. Now, one of the core things that a chemical engineer needs to be able to do is to design a column. And what you see here in this picture is a column. And the way that a column works uh, when you're doing chemical engineering is you insert your base material in the bottom of the column. There are a bunch of processes that happen as it goes up. And what you take out of the very top is your high-grade ethanol. And these can be several stories high. You can see the stairs going up on this one. Um, they're pretty cool. So designing of a column is like our equivalent of writing a computer program from scratch, greenfield development. And the question is, what, is this what Antonio spends his time doing, designing columns? What do you think? Nope. Sometimes. Right? Occasionally, he needs to design a column. And if you're doing software engineering, occasionally, you need to write a program, write a significant program, doing greenfield development. But that's actually not what he spends most of his time doing. Most of his time, he's responsible for this plant. They have to do renovations. They constantly need to add things. They need to deal with issues that come up. They need to prioritize. All this kind of stuff, that's what they do. Now, if you ask Antonio, like, what do you do? His response is going to be something about how many thousands of liters of alcohol this plant produces, right? That is the core focus. What do you do creates alcohol on a daily basis? Now, if we go and we ask Jane Programmer, what do you do? 
What is she going to say? Well, maybe something like this. I write C++ and Python. I have experience with Qt, and I think Boost is amazing. <laughs> right? Very much concentrated on the programming aspect. Now, if we go to Elena, software engineer, and we say, what do you do? She might respond something like this. I'm responsible for a message router that handles on average a billion requests per second under continuous load and is the backbone of Bloomberg's financial engine. So do you see the, the difference in the focus there? All right. Now, let's go back to this plant. If you have a new uh, chemical engineer and they see this plant, they're going to think, wow, this is, this is amazing. This is like fantastic. I get to be responsible for that plant, which is producing this many thousands of liters of alcohol per day. Like, what an exciting uh, prospect. Now, if you take the equivalent of a programmer and, uh, and they get faced with this in the equivalent of a code base, what do you think the response is going to be? Too much metal. Too much metal. Uh, it's it's going to be like, oh, oh, man, this code sucks. So I think that it's really interesting that we have this phenomenon in, in software engineering. Uh, here's another picture. Anybody recognize this? Yeah, so this is, this is a Falcon 9 launch. Right, SpaceX, they, they launch things about it. Now, one thing is really noticeable in this picture. Do you notice something kind of strange about it? It's not painted, it's not painted right? This, this piece in the middle, that reused first stage engine, it's ugly, right? It's used. And, and when SpaceX, SpaceX did this launch, uh, Elon Musk had to respond to this to all these comments about how this ugly first stage looks right and he gave this response and I thought it was absolutely fantastic obviously aesthetics are a minor factor in rocket design <laughs> right I think this applies to software development as well we tend to concentrate on aesthetics you look at a piece of code and if it's not indented in your favorite style you think it looks ugly right this is the focus of a programmer. But the focus of an engineer is a very different focus. And I would argue that aesthetics are a minor factor in software engineering. Or at least they should be. So you take something like this in, uh, in Antonio's plant here. And this is, I'm not really sure what it is, but there's a bunch of dials here probably measuring pressure of these various uh, tubes that are transporting material between places. Now, one thing that you might notice is that the paint on one of these tubes here is a little bit chipped off, right? Just over time, after it got painted, um, it doesn't look too good. So if a programmer approaches a code base and sees something ugly, like maybe const should really go here, or maybe this uh, for loop would be better placed as a range-based for loop. Programmer will typically like jump right into that and try to like fix that right away. But a software engineer is going to see these things in the context of their business value. How important is this to the business? Because if they spend time painting that little thing, that's time that could be spent doing something else. Could be potentially adding business value to the product. So, uh, so that's what that's about. If we look at Antonio's row, role, I kind of put it into these four different things. And I've spent a lot of time with Antonio. Uh, operations, making sure the system is up and running and stays up and running uh, is the number one most important thing. If, if a piece of software is gaining business value, I'll get you in a second. Uh, if a piece of software is gaining business value, the last thing that you want to do is shut that sucker off and not have business value anymore, right? That's number one. Number two, renovations. You have an existing piece of software and, or an existing system and you have to renovate it, right? Maybe that you want to have more capacity for the alcohol that you're generating. Or maybe there are better systems that can be put in place. 
And you do this to continually improve the, the system over time. And uh, there's also integrations. Uh, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. And then finally, there's design, right? This would be the equivalent of programming or, or making that new column. So all of these things are the responsibility of the chemical engineer, and I would argue also the software engineer. There's a question back there. Uh, more comments. I think that keeping up of color on, on a pipe is something we should rather take serious and not as a, just as a beauty thing. Um, because it could be a hint on a defect on the pipe. We should remember it. We should update the white to put on. And one thing is that you know the technical word or beauty thing in pipe. So the comment is, that maybe there's a serious problem with that pipe because that thing got chipped off. Maybe you should look into that. For the context of this talk, let's just say that that chip off is purely aesthetic to know which pipe is which. That's why they're different colors. All right. Maybe, unless they're not rustable. Anyway. <laughs> so. Uh, this is an example of a, of a kind of renovation that they did. So here, what you see are a bunch of screens that measure these sensors throughout the plant. Now this plant is very old, like certainly before I was born, this plant was created. Um, and they didn't start with this. But what happened is by doing this kind of automation uh, with their plant, they were able to go from having maybe three or four people constantly needing to, to run around um, and check the operations of things and check various gauges and make sure that everything is all kosher. They just need to have one person who sits here, keeps an eye on the entire uh, system, and one other person which goes and runs around and if there's some kind of issue, they'll go and like deal with some kind of issue. Right, so they were able to cut down on expenses. Automation of the kind of things that we do uh, in our systems is a very important thing, uh, frequently neglected. You know, how quickly, does it, how quickly can you go from a function declaration to all the call sites, right? If, you, if you're using like some old stale editor uh, without any kind of plugin capability and you're grepping through code, you're not using sufficient automation as a software engineer. Uh, or uh, if every time you make a release, you have some person manually run all the tests and make sure that everything is good to go. Um, that's a bunch of time that's being wasted or, or it could be recaptured by inserting more automation into your process. Doing automation is an important part of software engineering, one of the, one of the core competencies. So uh, when it comes to integrations, Antonio had some interesting ones. Uh, one is that they had this, there was this other business, I think that it was in Portugal, but it might have been in another part of Spain, that just went out of business and they needed to sell all their stuff and they had an existing plant for creating ethanol. And so they were able to buy that plant and they had to figure out some way to transport that plant all the way to Azucarero Montero and then integrate it with their existing system. Like that is just an immense project because plants aren't designed to be taken down and then just put up somewhere else. So they had to figure out where they wanna make the cuts, where they're gonna be able to stitch it all together, um, all the tubes that needed to be designed in order to be able to integrate it with their existing system. Like it was an incredibly large project and uh, these are the kinds of projects that we, that we really um, kind of balk at as software engineers. Um, it, it frequently happens that somebody will, uh, will acquire another business and they'll say, okay, now let's integrate all of our software together. And then, you know, five years later, it's just an immense disaster because we don't know how to do it. We don't have the skill set. And I'm, my claim is that if Antonio can transplant a chemical engineering plant, from one site to another site, something which was not designed to be moved at all, and you have to deal with physical stuff, then we should be able to do the same with software engineering. We shouldn't be balking at that. It should be, again, part of our core competencies. Um, another uh, project that he had is that uh, there was a sugarcane factory, and, and this is another thing that he kind of specializes in, uh, in the Dominican Republic that was just defunct uh, and just hadn't worked for, for years. And they took over that sugar plant, uh, that sugar cane plant, and they got it going again, having to replace whatever kind of motors, having to upgrade this and that, and they're able to restore this thing. So this is the idea of you take this old, crufty, nasty code base, and you take it on as a project, and you use it to be able to generate business value. 
right? Again, for a programmer, these are the kinds of things we shy away from, but a software engineer, this should be like, this should be the kind of problems that we solve. I think it's interesting. So some priorities that I uh, was able to gather uh, is uh, based on my interactions with Antonio. Uh, the first one there is long-term demonstrated success uh, versus new tech. The preference is the long-term demonstrated success. It doesn't matter if you know, some newfangled library happens to be using the latest promises or whatever kind of cool technology you want to name it. If it hasn't been deployed on a large scale, we should have a, a, a distrust for it, right? It makes more sense to go with something which has demonstrated success because that reduces the risk, All right? This goes counter a lot to the things that we think of in programming a lot of the time. Brand reputation matters. Uh, I, I know that there was a project uh, with Antonio that uh, they had to decide whether or not they wanted to purchase this particular product from China, which was extremely discounted, versus their normal European supplier, which was more expensive. And it was just like this big dilemma of like, well, do we go with the cheaper thing or do we go with well, like what we know? Uh, can we, we can trust these numbers from these people. We can't trust the numbers from the China, Chinese company. So brand reputation absolutely matters. Uh, Ironically, the preference is for used things versus new things. Because not only are used things frequently cheaper, but they have demonstrated performance. We know that they work. If you get something new which has never been used before, uh, there's an additional risk which is involved with it. So the preference is for, for used things. And the last thing, which I find really, really interesting, is in chemical engineering at least, there is, in other engineering fields, there is a ton of sharing going on between companies. Um, I've been with Antonio on several trips where we just go and visit a plant, we talk with other chemical engineers and they say, hey, you know, we did this system and this worked really well for us and we tried this, you know, this thing from China and it was junk and, or, you know, whatever it happens to be. Like the information sharing is incredible there. Uh, in software engineering, it seems like we have this like aversity. We think that if somebody looks at our code, like, oh, they're gonna get the secret sauce, right? But realistically speaking, are they going to get the secret sauce by looking at you know, some lines of our code in a you know, 5 million line code base or 10 million line code base? Probably not, right? So we could do a lot more with uh, sharing uh, with other companies. Now, I don't expect this to happen overnight. Maybe this is something, a prospect for like 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, I don't know. Um, but basically the way that we do information sharing right now is we have these folks that work for a place for a couple of years and they go work for another place for a couple of years and, 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 and they do all this, right? And then you can like figure out like, oh, this is how this other company works internally and such. But that has its own drawbacks, that approach. You know, first, uh, with, that, with this shuffling thing which we do in, in software engineering, um, you very rarely have to feel the impact of your mistakes, right? You're usually feeling the impact of somebody else's mistakes. If you work for a large system for a long period of time, like Antonio has been working on that plant for, uh, I don't know, probably longer than I've been alive. Um, you really get a, a wisdom and a knowledge that comes with working with the same system and learning things over time. It's just a different approach. So one kind of like success story uh, that I've had uh, and I've seen a lot is claim format. So how many of you are not using claim format? Okay, so for those of you who are not using Clang Format, you should use Clang Format. We would like to. <laughs> <laughs> you should do it. So, um, so Clang Format, so I learned about Clang Format at C++ now many years ago, and, uh, and I immediately applied it to where I was working and, and we started using it. And what it did is it saved a ton of time. Now, when it comes to like industry consensus, uh, in, in an engineering field, you wanna go with what, whatever the industry is doing, right? So Something that would be sane would be to you know, take Clang Format and say, hey, you know, what's the most popular formatting that's being used right now? What's the one that's most well supported? Okay, we'll switch to that format. And that's it, right? End of story. Something that would be a little bit crazier would be taking Clang Format and then like forking it and trying to make it match your coding standard and, and, and then support that thing in perpetuity, right? The idea is sticking with industry consensus from an engineering perspective makes a lot of sense. Uh, money-wise and, uh, and in terms of like the kind of technology you're going to get. So when we talk about innovation, I think that there's a very different set of things 
that you think of when you think about innovation when you're talking about an engineer and you're talking about a programmer. To an engineer, innovation is concentrating on that business value, right? If you do some kind of innovative thing, which means that you're able to capture this many more clients, you're able to shut down this many machines uh, to capture some kind of expense, these are innovations. Or your user base is going to be that much more enthusiastic about your software. Whatever it happens to be, this is what innovation is to an engineer. Innovation for a programmer, it, it, it tends to kind of like hyper-focus on the minutia, right? Uh, doing some like cool library, which maybe that you can use in like four cases in your, in your system. Now, from a software engineering standpoint, uh, that, kind of engineer, that kind of innovation is, uh, is really a misuse of resources. It's kind of a waste of time. Uh, the innovation that they're really looking for from an engineering standpoint are like these business value propositions. I don't know, does this kind of like ring true for you? Have you seen this? Yeah. All right, so let's talk about uh, something else that we don't normally talk about. Let's talk about garbage. Look at that garbage, beautiful stuff. What should we do with that garbage? Recycle it. Recycle it, oh, that would take a really long time. I and mean, you wanna shift through all that stuff? Yeah, dig a hole. Dig a hole, no, but that's terrible. Then, you know, you use all that space. Burn it. Burn it, <laughs> yes. So let's talk about Covanta in Union, New Jersey. They burn trash. And they burn 1,500 tons of solid waste per day. That's a lot of trash. It generates up to 42 megawatts of electricity, which they then sell. Uh, and that electricity powers 30,000 homes and businesses in the New Jersey area. So pretty good stuff. Now, I got a friend and his name is Bill Spann, and he is the operations manager and chief engineer at that Coverta plant. Um, one thing that you'll notice that he does differently is that he wears a nice button-down shirt and a jacket when he gives a talk. I don't know if we'll ever get there with software engineering. Maybe. Uh, but anyway, the way this plant works uh, is that on the bottom left there, you've got trash coming in. You got the dump trucks, dumps it into this big vat. And then you got this electronic arm which picks up the trash and puts it on this conveyor belt and drops it down here and it burns it. The burnt trash uh, boils water, right? So you get like this high energy steam. The steam goes up over here, and there's actually three of these boilers, so you're only seeing one of them here. The steam goes up here and it attaches to this turbine and this is a steam-based turbine engine. So you put in steam and it just starts spinning like a, like a motor there. The turbine engine is stuck into this generator with that, which then generates electricity and then electricity goes to the electricity company and they give it to all the people who need electricity. That's how their system works. That's their software. Now, I had a conversation with Bill, it was an awesome conversation. He told me all about what they do and the way that he thinks. Uh, one of the things that he came, he told me about is they have these service level objectives. Have you ever heard of a service level objective before? Raise your hand if you have. Okay, almost everybody, fantastic. So each of the boilers has a 95% uptime target. Uh, and there's three of them, like as I mentioned. The turbine has 99% uptime because the turbine goes down, they're not, <coughs> they're not giving electricity to the electricity company and they can get penalties uh, for not giving as much electricity as they agreed to. And I asked him, how did they come up with these numbers? And he said it's based on historical data, on, on what it was able to produce, and is a bit of a reach. You know, it's, it's not like comfortable level, it's like a little bit uncomfortable, so they need to continuously improve their system to improve their uptimes and improve profitability for the business. So, uh, we talk about wanting SLOs for uh, software development a lot. Very rarely do I see people actually have them and measure them. Like one particular example, uh, well, let me just ask you this. Do you have sporadic test failures with your continuous integration system? Raise your hand if you do. Okay, almost everybody, all right? So in the ideal world, you don't have sporadic test failures. It either passes or it fails. In the real world, 
you're going to have sporadic test failures. It's just the nature of the game, especially if you're doing something with multi-threaded code. Someone's going to write a test somewhere, which is going to have some dependency on the system or the timing or something like that, and you're going to get sporadic test failures. So, uh, how many of you have a service level objective for your sporadic test failures? Okay, just a couple of us. So, what this means is that we're allowed to have sporadic test failures because we know that from an engineering standpoint, going and spending all of our time fixing them does not make good business sense. Uh, you want to keep a certain level of what percentage of the time uh, when you run your build, you know, on master or whatever, does it have a test failure, right? So we have an SLO of, of uh, one nine, right, 90%. Uh, we're going for a 99% SLO for this. We may not want to go all the way there because it could be very expensive, but uh, 90 is where we're at. Um, How much? 90? 90. Uh, so another thing is, you know, think about whether or not you measure your surface level indicator for the one other person over there. Your SLO, do you measure your SLO for your sporadic test failures? I wouldn't say we measure it, but we monitor it weekly. Okay, so they monitor it weekly. Good. Uh, so we measure our service level indicator. Uh, we have uh, what's called a canary job. It just runs every hour or so, just a plain build on master. Let's see what happens, right? And it's not just sporadic test failures. It's also a sporadic machine goes down or something is turning. You know, all these kinds of things feed into this, uh, to this issue. We measure it. We know where we're at. And we can track it over time and see like, oh, something's falling down. We need to do something about it. And, and, our, and our software engineers that are working on this have done a very good job with doing this kind of thing. But anyway, service level objectives, measuring them, this is standard fare for engineering and other disciplines. For software engineering, we're kind of rediscovering this stuff uh, just recently. So another thing that, that Bill does, or he was telling me about, is they do a turbine overspeed test. So what they do is they take that, that lever that right before it goes in the turbine, open it up a little bit, and see if they can spin that turbine faster than they normally would, right? And see what happens. You know, does it uh, vibrate more than they expect? Does it actually shut down? Do they have some kind of problem? And they verify whether or not a greater load can be handled. And, and this is what he said. He said, a this is a scheduled risk to prevent unscheduled risks. If you open it up, well, everybody's there. We know that we're running this test and there's a problem. They can fix the problem. If it happens to, you know, get overloaded on some weekend, now they've got to pay people overtime and everybody's in a crunch to try to fix the problem. Right, so we can do the same kind of thing with our own projects. You know, just, just think about your project and what it means to have an overspeed test. If you're running something which is performance critical, then you could run a performance test. If you're running something which has other kinds of like points of failure, you can try to do things. Uh, one of the things that, that is, is commonly talked about is to have like an outage test, like a planned outage, if you happen to have like a cloud-based service or something like that, and see what happens. Let's see how you react, let's see how the system does. All right, another project, he had was the Inganel project. Um, and they have a, a specialized coating on the tubes, is something that was invented recently, that can prevent failures. A couple of things about it is that <gasps> this is very, very expensive stuff, right? So they're doing an incremental deployment of this coating. Uh, they're starting at the critical sites, sites which they know have a lot of stress on them. They're gonna, they do this coating on it and they're starting there. And they're applying it slowly over several years of time and eventually they're going to have all their tubing coated with this uh, this Inganel stuff. Now this can apply to our projects as well. Take for example um, a static analyzer or something like that, like Coverity or some other static analyzer. If you have a sizable code base, it makes very little sense to run it on your entire code base and then fix all the issues, right? It would be way too expensive. Uh, but what you can do is you can start by running it on your critical places. And then slowly over time, make sure you schedule it into your, to your software engineering schedule to gradually apply it everywhere. Then maybe eventually you do have full coverage with this kind of stuff. But the idea is to, is to spread uh, the cost over time. Comment over there. Is a reasonable idea or 
so the comment is that for greenfield projects, one of the one of the things that they do is they gate new software from being put into the master branch or whatever the equivalent is uh, until it, it passes these kinds of tests. Uh, is that a valid approach? I think it definitely is, right? You know, if, if you go into Home Depot or one of these other big box stores and you and you see, uh, if you go to the electricity section, I don't know if you've ever like done any wiring in your houses or anything like that, they have this section called old work and they have a section called new work. And the old work is, to, is to made to build into your existing system, right? New work is something else. But whatever you do, you got to make sure that it's going to be up to code, whatever kind of changes that you make. So I think that, that that applies as well. So another thing they do is that they have periodic ma maintenance. So two times per year, each boiler is taken down. And once every four to five years, the turbine is taken down. Obviously, the turbine has that really high SLO, uh, so they can't take it down as frequently. And what they do is they take everything apart, revisit everything, put it all back together again, and see if it still works. Now, if you, if, you, if you do this in your own software systems, if you have an existing code base, and you revisit things, not because you have to do something there, but just because as part of your periodic maintenance, let's just take you know over, over a time period and look at all the critical pieces of our code base and revisit and do another code review, or do another kind of questioning of how does this work, um, and does, does it still make sense for us to do things this way? I think that that would be pretty cool. Um, I think that would have a lot of impact. Um, I've never heard of anybody actually doing that in the software engineering, but outside of software engineering, it seems pretty be pretty common. Uh, I have heard that certain parts of Bell Labs used to do that. They rewrote ten percent of the code base every year. Ah, so the comment is that certain parts of Bell Labs used to do something like this, where they uh, replace twenty percent of their code every year. Yeah, John Reiser told me that when I worked at Bell Labs. Cool. So, uh, renovations sometimes cause outages. So there was an example uh, that Bill was telling me about where they did some turbine improvements. And they were really improvements. They, they, it was able to make the turbine work much more efficiently, which means that it spun faster. But the rest of their system wasn't able to handle the increased vibrations from the things spinning faster. They didn't foresee this. It just happened that way. And so what they did, because it resulted in, in, a, in a lengthy outage, is they stopped the periodic testing for uh, the, for a little while, right? Because testing, every time you do some kind of testing, it does increase your risk. So the key idea here is that they're spreading risk over time. This is why they, this is why they did this, right? You don't do all of your uh, boilers at the same time, right? You do one boiler, then you do another boiler, then the one after that, so the other two can kind of compensate for it. If you take everything down and you put it back together and they all happen to be messed up, you're in deep trouble. So, there's this idea of spreading risk in software development, right? So uh, continuous deployment is one way to do that. Every time you make a software change, you, if, as soon as possible, you can redeploy it, whether that means you know, putting it on some kind of cloud system or whether it means releasing the software in some kind of beta form that users can give you feedback on. If you, if you wait all the way until you have your major release before you have people start uh, using all these new features, you're going to find out that you, basically all of your risk happens at, at that one moment, right? It's better to spread it over time. It makes more business sense. Uh, and then incremental changes, right? If you have an existing system and you're, you're, you're modifying some kind of system, some piece of it, and you have the option to replace the entire piece or make an incremental improvement to the piece, the incremental improvement is going to have much uh, better risk uh, implications for it. Right, and that kind of goes counterintuitive. You, you might, but, but it's really old and crufty and it, it could be so much better. But, but from a business perspective, from an engineering perspective, it can often make a lot more sense to just do things very incrementally. And there's a skill to it, a skill that I don't think uh, has developed very much yet in software engineering and making these incremental changes to, long, uh, to large systems. So, migration failures. Um, I could give an entire talk on migration failures, but I have compiled a little checklist that I wanted to share with you about if you want a migration failure, do one or more of these things. So the first one is the 2.0 migration. Anybody want to take a gander at what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the 2.0 migration? Is that the second system syndrome? 
the, <laughs> the second system syndrome. Yes. Let's redevelop it from scratch, right? Sometimes this works, maybe 10% of the time. Uh, but basically the idea is, is I understand why people are using my system. I understand what their requirements are completely so well that I can write a new system from scratch and deploy it and know that they will, everything's gonna be okay. And when you think about it, it's kind of preposterous. You know, you typically aren't the only one that's ever developed that system. If, if it's been over several years, there are probably people who've touched that code that are no longer with the company. And you can go in and make some kind of assumption about why they made something act in this way and change it and screw it up. Now, anytime somebody uh, does a 2.0 migration, they always think, but, but it's different for me, right? Yeah, 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 90% of the time it fails, but I'm one of the 10%. Well, the likelihood of you failing is 90%, right? So you have to look at it in the aggregate and, and think about risk from that perspective. Maybe it would succeed, maybe, but chances are against you if you do a 2.0 migration. Uh, the second one there is the opt-in migration. Anyone want to take a guess as to what that one's about? No one's taking a guess. So this is the idea. Well, well, this is the idea of opt-in migration is you come up with a new version and you tell your people, please opt into this new version when you have some time. Python 3, <laughs> Python 3 is, is a fantastic example of this. Python 3 as an aside, I think that's probably the biggest software engineering disaster we've seen so far. Uh, so the opt-in migration, it, if you wanna support two systems, this is a great way to do it because you're gonna be supporting the old and the new forever. And if you don't learn your lesson, you're not just gonna have two systems, you're gonna have another opt-in migration. Now you got three systems, now you got four, now you got five. I've, I've seen upward of this many systems going on at the same time because of this fallacy that uh, the people do this because they want migration failures. Okay, uh, the third uh, item in the migration failure checklist is tying one migration to another migration. So this is, I'm gonna make this change, but oh, they're also working on this new thing over there. I'll use the new thing, and then when they're done, I should be about done, and then you know it'll all work together, right? What happens if you tie your migrations together is that it increases the, the likelihood of your migration to fail because all migrations have a failure rate, right? And if you tie a whole chain of them together and wait for all these things to happen in order for you to, you do your, you do your, your migration, uh, there's like a chaining effect. You know, this migration failure implies migration failures everywhere else. So go ahead and use the existing system, like even though they're developing some newfangled thing so that you don't tie the migrations together. Uh, uh, comment was C++11. I'm not sure uh, what's meant by that. Oh, yeah, yeah, so yeah, so I'll use C++11 and eventually we're gonna upgrade our compilers and, uh, and it'll all fit together. Yep. Uh, the last one is deploying everything all at once. Uh, just deploy it all at once and then boom, right? So the idea is incremental deployment works much better. All right, we're gonna shift now into the philosophical portion of this. And so I'm gonna start with a quote from Nietzsche. Many are stubborn in the pursuit of the path they have chosen, few in pursuit of the goal. Right? That's kind of true. So ultimately when people do things in your software code base, even if they're a programmer, they have good intentions, right? There, there is that goal in mind that this is somehow gonna improve business value. But they don't realize that the path they have chosen is not uh, actually helping the goal. But they just like go on that path. And they, and they fall in love with the path as opposed to the ultimate goal. So software fitness theory. This is the big idea. And I'm not exactly happy with this formulation. Uh, we can iterate on it, but the first point is that software is a means to an end. And when I talk about an end, I'm not talking about an end in the temporal sense, as in like it ends here 
you know, the end can be a continuous flow of income. The end can be uh, making some kind of improvement in society. And, you know, that is what, what I'm talking about when I'm talking about end. And it's not fixed, as in the sense of uh, you have this end and that's what it is over, like all the time. Like the end changes over time, like what you're going for. And the second point in software fitness theory is that fitness is observed by measured proximity to the end. How do you know if your software is fit? Well, you know if it's fit if it's meeting those end goals, right? So this is, uh, we're gonna unpack this quite a bit. Has a lot of implications. Um, but let's start by, let's do another quote from Nietzsche here. Convictions are more dangerous foes of truth than lies. If you're convinced beyond any reasonable doubt about something, and somebody comes at you with a counter argument, what do you think about that counter argument? Well, you're already convinced, right? There's, there's nothing that they can bring to you because you're convicted, you know that this thing is true. Now, if you have a false, uh, something that you know which happens to be false, and someone says, oh, oh, oh that's not right. Uh, like, here's the truth. When you get confronted with the truth, you can now understand the truth. But convictions are really dangerous. So this is where we're talking about ideologies. Ideologies make for really easy dopamine hits. What do I mean by that? Let's say that you happen to uh, be part of an ideology which says that software is good if every function has documentation for it. Now, you open up some kind of code and you see there's not some documentation there and then you go and you add documentation where it's all missing and as soon as you're done adding all that documentation, what happens? Boom, dopamine hit. Feels good, right? Uh, to-do list, right? You get the same kind of thing. You write a to-do list and you check everything off and if you check everything off, then that means success for you and so when you finish checking everything off, you get a dopamine hit. This is why people love ideologies, right? Because it, it feeds back into our human uh, joy systems. Now, the fanboy is the most dangerous thing when you, when you attach an ideology. So the fa fanboy will measure software quality by proxim proximity to the ideology. So let's say uh, we, we continue with that ideology that uh, software is quality if all the functions are documented. Uh, the fanboy is going to look at a piece of software and see, hey, this isn't all documented. Therefore, this code is crap. Even if that code is, has immense business value, it could have a sustainable like, advantage over all the competition because of the way that it's implemented or, or whatever's in there. The fanboy isn't going to see any of that because they're stuck to their ideology. So when we're talking about software fitness and software fitness theory, proximity to a particular ideology is unlikely to be a good measure of software fitness. Right, that's one of the key takeaways. Uh, you're gonna hear lots of ideologies. You probably have some off the top of your head that you, that you have yourself, right? Ideologies of what, what good software is. But what software fitness theory is saying is like, be very wary of this kind of stuff. And then the last thing is that ideologies by their very nature are oversimplifications, right? The real world is a very complex thing. And if you boil it down to some kind of like truths, uh, you're going to have an oversimplification and they do lead to absurdities. I'll give you an example of that. So one ideology that uh, people are aware of is don't repeat yourself. How many people have heard this ideology in one form or another? Everybody, right? It's very common. So let's see what, what happens here. So here we have a main function and it's written like this, int main, int argc, char star star argv. How many of you have written this kind of code? Everybody, right? What a bunch of repetition. <laughs> so let's, let's do what this ideology says. <coughs> let's make a macro. Now, now what's interesting is a lot of folks in here are probably saying, man, this, is, this, is, this would be a terrible idea because of another ideology, which is macros. macros are bad, right? 
But if we talk about software fitness, and you take, a, take this and you implement this into your system, and you start changing all of your source code, anytime you have the int main, you use this new macro, you're like, don't repeat yourself. This is making the code better. When people that are on your team see this code, aside from thinking that you're a schmuck, um, they're, they're first are not gonna recognize it. Like, what the heck is this main lib main thing? Like, they don't know what this is. They've never seen it before. So their time to be able to get up to speed on terms of what's going on here, it's, it increases. Um, other people might come and look at your code with the no macros ideology and say, your code is crap. So when we're talking about software fitness, there are a whole lot of stakeholders here. And this will actually decrease the software fitness in your code, even though it gets closer proximity to the ideal of the don't repeat yourself. All right. Here's another ideology that's out there. So Adam Wiggins' 12 factors. Have any of you heard of this before? Okay, a handful of you. Uh, so what Adam did is he made a list of 12 criteria that if you do all these criteria, then your service code is good. And if you don't do it, your service code is bad. And if you have a fanboy that goes into this thing and says, hey, uh, let's say we want to do, I don't know, treat backing services as attached resources. This might not make business sense if you have an existing service. Like someone could actually spend a lot of time to get number four here and it's just completely wasted effort because it didn't improve the, uh, the business value of the software. It didn't improve the software fitness. Um, so back on software fitness, let me just go back to this slide. Is this code fit? For something. It yeah. might be fit for a testing framework. Okay, comment is, is fit for a testing framework. Anything more local? It'll execute. Like if it does the job, then. I don't think it looks that bad. Okay, people yeah. love this code. <laughs> but when we're talking about software fitness. You have to tell me more, is what I'm saying. I, I would argue that this code is fit for this slide. <laughs> Right? It illustrates a point. Any kind of software that you write, it has a certain context which you're doing it, even if it's software written on a slide. Okay, we talked about the 12 fa factors. So I was once in a standardization meeting where Bjarne said this thing. He said, if you don't rely on feedback, then it isn't decent engineering. He kind of said it, said it in a flustered tone. I think he was upset, but I think that it has a really good point. How do we get feedback with code? What's our primary means? Any ideas? It works. Code review. Or it works. So I heard code review. That's what, that's what I was thinking of. Code review. So code review is kind of a simulation of what happens when someone has to revisit your code three months, three years down the line. Right? And what you're doing is you're basically compressing that experience into a, a fixed time period. So Feedback is incredibly important. We already do this and we see whether our code that we're writing actually fits in our team by getting these peer reviews. And the more reviews that you get, the more likely if you incorporate that feedback is going to be fit for that purpose. But fitness is not just a social construct, right? The code you write is not just about uh, the people that you, that you happen to work with. Like, there are more factors in, at play here. And we'll get to that in a second. But I want to talk about another ideology. This one is fun. Correctness. Code which is correct is good. Code which is not correct is bad. Code with bugs is bad. All right. So does anybody see a problem with this, what I have here on the screen? OK, I see one back. Overflow. Overflow. Exactly. So this code, if it does what it says that it's going to do, it's going to have some kind of overflow problem. Now, we can say that it has inherently a bug, but does that tell us something about the software fitness? If you never happen to call that with 
integers that would overflow. It might be fine for your software. It might be completely fit, even though it has a bug. Now, before you go tell everybody that David Sankel said bugs are okay, <laughs> like, keep in mind that software fitness is a different thing and that correctness is an ideology. So, um, all right. Or, or another thing is maybe you, you do give these numbers that do overflow and it returns some kind of, in realistic speaking, I mean, in, in reality, it's not some crazy blow up your machine behavior and you get some weird number for, as a result. Maybe that doesn't matter for your system. Maybe that ha happens so infrequently that it doesn't have any impact on uh, business value whatsoever. If that's the case, prioritizing fixing that bug may not make it very much sense when you have other things that actually can improve your software fitness. You don't know that it overflows because you don't see the implementation. So maybe this is just the documentation for the user. It doesn't mention that it throws an exception that it overflows or something. Okay, so the comment is that it could throw an exception overflow. Sure, but for the context of this, let's just assume that it does the wrong thing. All right. Yes, a comment. Do you think correctness ideology has a component in fear? Do I think correctness ideology has a component in fear? <coughs> Maybe? I'm reminded of Kate's talk. Like, someone would look at this and say, in, in, in a straw man argument to, to what you just said, you know, yes, this is okay now, but at any point, a compiler upgrade could take advantage of this UB and completely break things. <laughs> Yes, I mean, there, there is fear that a compiler optimization can completely break things, but probably not, right? It's, it's, it's just risk. But sometimes it could be good for, like, say, new contributors to focus on some, because the requirements of these things are easier to specify, and it's easier because it's a lower priority and it's not as big of an issue. If the new contributor ends up not achieving the goal of actually fixing it correctly, they're not as concerned about it if they fix on the main part of it, but at least it, it would give them familiar with the code base that later on they can move on to the more important map. Okay, so to kind of paraphrase what you said, Sorry. <laughs> it could be useful to have somebody fix this bug, even though it's not really improving the software fitness, because you don't want them touching some other part of your code or whatever, as an example. So maybe, yeah, sure, why not? All right. I knew this would be controversial. Okay. When we talk about sorting and correctness ideology, this sort could be correct, but it could have another problem. What problem might it have? It doesn't deal with null pointers. Different problem. Stability, sure. It's also not sorting the letter of lists. No, I think this is valid. Uh, but. The, actually, the thing I was having in mind was performance, right? Performance is a completely different thing than correctness. It's not covered by correctness at all. So you might say, well, here's how to improve this. Big O N log N time, all right? So now we've added that into our contract. Is this fit as far as performance goes? Maybe. It completely depends. Um, you don't know. Maybe this needs to be run on a very special platform, or maybe that it, it has um, particular list sizes, which is being called with, and so you may want to do one of the you know, non-big O n log n sort algorithms. Like that constant factor can make a big difference, and it's highly dependent on the hardware that you're actually using. So just smacking you know, big O n log n on there does not help you with your performance software fitness, not enough. If you want to talk about software performance fitness, you have to measure it. Okay, but there are other fitnesses that, uh, aspects of fitness for a code like this that are important. Another one could be security fitness. Maybe you have a system that you want to make sure that this vector in list that gets passed into here is only in a particular segment of me memory. And you want to guarantee that program wide. So you may have some doctored up compiler, some kind of extensions to the language to be able to give you that kind of guarantee because that's what fitness means in your security context. So when it comes to security, how can we measure security fitness? 
I don't know. What, what do you think? What would be a good measure of security fitness? Fuzzing. Fuzzing. Okay. Another. Red team. Red team. Uh, so to really know if, if software is secure is if it doesn't get hacked. <laughs> if it didn't get hacked, it was secure for that period of time. But this idea of a red team, I think, is a fantastic one. So if you have a team of security experts that are constantly trying to hack your application and are unable to do so, then that gives you some kind of indication of whether or not you have security. It's very similar to the code review. You know, like what's it going to be like for someone modifying this code? You know, three years down the line, compress that into a smaller time period and have a ton of people act as if they were doing that right now, and then you you can do the similar kind of thing. I think before you can measure security fitness, you need to measure like what's the cost of having security broken. Yeah. Yep. There's a, the comment of what's the cost of having security broken, and that also goes into what does fitness mean for your application? Absolutely. So to kind of extend this into a principle is that a good way to achieve fitness is to put your candidate into a hostile environment. And this ties very much into uh, Darwin's theory of evolution. That's why I'm using the word fitness here. If you put your stuff into a hostile environment, that will give you some kind of indication of fitness that, and use that feedback, as Bjarne was talking about. If you just put it into a hostile environment and don't do anything about it, obviously that doesn't help you, right? But if you use that as, as feedback into your, uh, into your software development, then that can actually be a pretty good way. So, some hostile environments. Code review, we talked about that extensively. Manufactured break-in attempts. UI feedback, taking your UI, putting it in front of a bunch of users and say, use this as you would you know, do your normal workflow. That's a hostile environment and, and incorporating that feedback. Getting API feedback. A lot of people design APIs based on ideologies and then they throw their API out there and it's not successful. If you, if you take your API and put it in front of your actual users and ask them to do something with it and incorporate that feedback, that hostile environment will actually help you a lot more than anything else. Uh, and then stress testing is another really good one. All right. So this idea of software fitness, I like it for many reasons. One of the key ones is that I think it unifies our software engineering disciplines. It gives us a vocabulary of talking about it and talking about why we do them. There are things that, on this list that are considered good practice already but this tells us why we consider it good practice. And it gives us ideas for other things to come. You figure out what software fitness means for your software that you're developing, and then you figure out how to throw it into a hostile environment and incorporate that feedback, right? It could be something that you have, you know, we have, when you do a, uh, like a pull request or something like that, or, or a, a sprint item, uh, there's this idea of acceptance criteria. Something else that could possibly go in there is, what is the software fitness? What does software fitness mean for this change? And how are we verifying that we're going to somehow be able to succeed with the software fitness? Uh, comment. Yeah, David, I just wanted to mention that on your list of software engineering disciplines, there's one, in my opinion, is very important that's missing, and that is requirements analysis. If they don't understand the requirements, someone doesn't specify what the requirements are for the application you're trying to build, how can you even measure fitness? And you've talked about the difference between engineering and programming. I would say the biggest difference between an engineer and a programmer is an engineer thinks about the requirements, whereas a programmer is just writing code. So uh, to paraphrase that, something that's missing on this list that could definitely go on there is requirements analysis. And uh, I, I very much agree that the figuring out what fitness means for your thing is like a very important aspect of software engineering, engineering in general. Right, but no requirements that has ever survived for the deployment in my, in my experience. So the comment is, is that no requirements list has ever survived first deployment. And that's also the idea of requirements change over time, right? They're, the end is not a fixed point in time or a fixed thing. The end is constantly changing. Uh, the listing code review there, like, that can bring in a lot of unnecessary ideologies, but 
and I, you know, oh, make this bright, how to find the name, you know, and <laughs> something like that there. Like, how do you, how do you guide that between not getting to that kind of level of... So, uh, the comment is, is that doing a code review can bring in a lot of extra ideologies, um, and as we can see, ideologies can waste a lot of time or, or, or not necessarily good business value. And I very much agree with that. And I've seen this happen quite a bit. And I think that we need to start thinking of our code reviews as the simulation of the future maintainer, not uh, as this is your chance to insert all of your ideologies. Can you read the code? Does it make sense? Are you gonna be able to continue developing this code? If you answer those questions in the affirmative, then it's probably good to go, even if it's not matching your particular ideology. Another comment back there. I was just going to say that in some, in some circumstances, uh, soft factors like readability or understandability or maintainability are actually specified as part of the requirements, mm -hmm. especially if one is working on a product where one is engineering an API for an, another customer. Uh, so one comment is that part of the product is the specification of the API. Yeah, well, the readability understandability of the API, you can put requirements around that to say that, you know, you can even try and put numbers on it. Well, if somebody looks at this code, they should be able to understand it within an hour, for example. And that's a way of trying to quantify, to some extent, the, the soft concept of readability and understandability. So the comment is that you could, I'm, I'm not going to get the whole thing, but, 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 but the example is that if you put in your requirements, for example, some metric that someone should be able to pick up this and be able to get working with it within an hour or something like that, you can maybe quantify some of these fitness factors. All right, uh, we'll go over here. Yeah, what was really hard for us with the code review, you know, a lot of people say like, especially style, it, it's style checker. And you say like, look, code review is a style checker, you're not allowed to comment on style because everything that the code uh, style checker accept is acceptable style. And then you have like this big chunk, you, you already have out of the code review, basically. So the comment is, is that uh, you can like disallow comments about style in a code review. That's one way to kind of deal with this stuff. I would like to push back a little bit on this bashing of ideology. <laughs> okay. Um, because they're extremely useful crutches until you're able to transcend them. Because before you understand them, they make you write better code. And once you understand them, you don't need them anymore. Uh, so the comment is, is that ideologies are a good crutch uh, until you are able to transcend them. And I, I would argue that that transcendence is the turning of a programmer into a software engineer. All right, coming over here. Uh, so, with regard to the first comment, which is uh, how do you measure software fitness? Uh, you, just like an engineer can't say, uh, like, a, like a chemical engineer can't say what are the important things for any chemical engineering project, I'm not going to be able to say that for uh, a generalized software project. Right? I think that a software engineer needs to figure out what these factors are. Like we talked about some things, uh, readability might be important, uh, some of these other factors, but it really highly depends on what you're doing. And, that, and figuring out what the fitness criteria are and how to measure them is your job as an engineer. So along the lines of uh, pushing back against ideology and doing that thing, uh, I think ideologies are terrific if they come with an escape hatch. In other words, if I have an absolutist ideology that says macros are verboten, I will never use a macro for anything, I'm, I'm leaving out a lot of per perfectly good use case for macros. Um, but I have a, an ideology that says, like, I'm going to write pure functions unless there's a reason not to. And that's the reason not to exists a large amount of time. I don't write a lot of pure functions as a proportion, but I'm always trying to, and I think it leads to better code. 
and, and I'm not I'm not an absolutist. I'm not like making crazy uh, crazy mistakes in order to get to pure function. And that's the difference between a good and a bad ideology. So the comment is that Zach likes his ideologies. <laughs> <laughs> you can tear him away from his dead fingers. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to take one more question because I do have a few more slides to get to. So one interesting thing about comparing chemical engineering, civil engineering, to software engineering, uh, as the channel Uncle Bob's talk uh, from a while back, uh, the one difference that is easy to overlook is the lack of like code and regulations. Uh, so what do we do? <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going to be able to capture that, but the comment is, is that our field is different than the other fields uh, because of codes and regulations, which I think you're saying apply to those other fields more than us. Well, uh, well, there are fields that, I mean, like automotive has these huge high standards that have to be like multi layer compliant and all this other kind of stuff. You know, so there is like some type of regulation on the stuff itself in certain fields. So I'm, I'm not going to repeat that. Uh, so, all right. We have this idea, this, this unification of software disciplines under a common framework, we can talk about it. I think that's cool. I think it answers a lot of open questions. Why do so many successful projects have such bad code? They're fit, right? That's why. You're, you're measuring bad code by ideological standards. Um, if, if the code is successful, it is, by definition, fit. Um, I'm not going to answer all these questions. I'll leave that as an exercise. If you can think about how software fitness plays into this, like what makes a good API and, and so on, I'll leave that as an exercise for you to think about. Understanding machine learning. Uh, so uh, this is kind of a sad story, but on March 26th, uh, this guy, Walter, Walter uh, his Tesla took him out of his lane, pointed him at a fixed concrete bar barrier, and then accelerated. Boom, the car broke. I think that this guy is still alive. He survived it. Oh, he didn't survive it? Oh, that's more sad. But anyway, uh, machine learning is a, a different way of creating software where we're not involved. This whole idea of correctness is not, not a thing that you can apply to it. But software fitness does, right? Software fitness criteria applies to machine learned generated software. And we can use that. Another aspect is how it relates to artificial intelligence. Like if you want to pass the Turing test, what would be a good way to develop a piece of software which, which does? Uh, whether it's machine learning based or somebody's actually programming it to try to simulate a human being, the best way to be able to develop artificial intelligence is by using feedback and putting it into a hostile environment and being able to, to get that and then incorporate that into your software. You're, you're never gonna be able to create artificial intelligence by just sitting you know, somewhere uh, in Aspen Meadows and just thinking about it and then having the idea and coding it up. Right, the only way you're gonna be able to get it, in my opinion, <coughs> is by uh, checking this fitness, put it into a hostile environment and continue iterating on it. Now, one other aspect is C++ is success. Why, why is C++ successful? I mean, it's 30 years old. So on April 8th, 2019, I saw, I don't know if any of you have seen this article, but ZDNet reported that C++ rose to third place in Tyobi's Programming Language Popularity Index for 2019, displacing Python. So what, what's going on here? Why is C++, this old aging language, still at the top of the stack? And I think that it's because from the very get-go, C++ was designed by engineers. Why did C++ have C compatibility from the beginning? It fits so much better that way. All this existing C code could be taken advantage of. Um, why does it stay popular? All the changes that we're making to the language, by and large, don't break programs, by and large. Right? We don't have an ideology that we can't break your code. You know, on the standardization committee, we'll break your code. But we do have this idea of we don't want to break everybody's code. We don't want to have people have a crazy migration path to upgrade to the newest version of C++. So it's certainly much harder 
than developing a new language, extending the existing language, but it has a much better software fitness implication. And I think that as long as we keep this mentality, uh, C++ will continue to stay at the top of these lists. Come Uh, so the, the, there was the comment that uh, there are ideologies that are creeping up in the committee. Some of them are like, don't break anything anywhere. Another one is like, let's not do weird, strange things. Uh, and I totally agree. And, I, and this happens. Like my, the ideology that I hate the most in C++ is that the C++ standard library should only be low-level things. Why? It's just an ideology, right? If we can add something which doesn't happen to be a low-level thing that improves C++ software fitness, then we should do that, right? Uh, so I, I very much agree uh, that, that there is the danger of ideologies, but thus far, it seems like we've stuck with uh, software fitness enough to be able to stay at the top. Now, if other languages come out and they're, and they're more like into this idea, then they may be able to win. Um, but so anything that I've seen thus far, um, you know, whether it's Rust or Swift or any of these other kind of things, they completely miss this point. Uh, so the comment is, is that because C++ has so many implementations out there, um, having multiple implementations can give us better feedback and so that we can improve our software fitness that way. That's one aspect of it. It's a good point. Um, so just hold your question. Uh, we're almost at the end. So fitness, this idea of software fitness. There is a generalized fitness theory that goes along with this. And I'm not gonna talk about it, I'm just gonna kinda hint at it. Uh, if you wanna talk with me about it afterwards, we can talk about it. But it does have implications in, in music and in ethics and, and a few other different areas. So just a little tidbit there. So now let's go to the questions. Or comments. All right. Yeah, I think that was a really interesting comment that um, debug is about doing implementation and that is always possible because there's a requirement to block demand. So, so the standard actually specifications and, and with like other languages you don't have this requirement clear requirement specification on what is the language exactly supposed to do and in C as in software you can argue what is you can argue much better about correctness because you have the requirement specification you can argue the language should exactly be that that's why I think it's also why it's so popular especially like when I say it's a good uh, application or with Python you should say like I, I, I try out so the comment is that having a specification uh, improves C++'s applicability and having multiple implementations forces a specification and that helps in certain fitness in certain fields. Uh, like what were some of the examples you cited there? Yeah, like uh, safety critical applications. Like safety, safety critical applications. We'll not repeat it. We're good. I want to make a comment about uh, your, the first part of your talk. You mentioned the, the uh, alcohol distillation plant, and you talked about the power plant, and you mentioned the practice that, that they had, but you thought we could use analog to those practices in software engineering. And you were kind of, I think explicitly, but also implicitly asking the question, these guys in these established industries are doing these smart things. Why aren't we doing it? And I think 
Part of the answer was accounting. In your talk in CPECON 2016, you talked about software capital and technical debt, right? Currently, there's no way under the generalized, generally accepted accounting principles to financially account for technical debt. So technical debt does not appear on the books of the company. Mm -hmm. And frankly, I think we all know if it actually did, lots of companies would panic and lots of value would disappear. And if until uh, the accounting rules actually take into account the idea of technical debt, like they do depreciation on capital assets that you buy for a plan, for example, the changes that we'd like to see are going to be, they're not going to come because there's no financial incentive to make those changes. So the comment is that uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> that technical debt should be valued in an accounting sense, and that could potentially improve things. So there are there are some fields that it's required. Okay, so in safety critical industries, yes. Medical imaging, automotive, uh, aerospace, yes. Mm -hmm. But by and large, in general, it is not. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so the so the comment is, is that in certain industries there is this accounting for technical debt in terms of like number of outstanding bugs and things like that, and there are requirements to like burn those things down. All right, go ahead, Ben. So it seems to me that functional programming has taken off massively in the field of programming language. Is that a fitness thing or an ideology thing? Uh, so the comment is that functional programming has uh, taken off in terms of language design. And is this an ideology thing or is it a fitness thing? I don't know. It's a good question. Is that the measure of the fitness of ideology? Yeah, fitness of ideology. <laughs> 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 That's one of our new fitness ideology. <laughs> um, uh, I want to ask about the question basically is how would you go about determining whether something is aesthetic? So, so earlier in the talk, you, discussed, you talked about the ugly rocket not being a factor, um, but then you mentioned indentation of code and cost correcting, which to me are not really about aesthetics. They're more like hygiene at the workplace, <laughs> where you don't have that. Like, you know, like the workers suffer, and it actually hinders our readability and things like that, which is not like far from aesthetics, right? Um, and so, like, oftentimes it gets kind of difficult to determine whether it's just an aesthetic thing or it actually, if it actually matters. Um, so, uh, so, you know, so, how would you go about determining those? Uh, so the question is, how do you go about determining uh, what is merely aesthetics and what is actually has a real impact? And I think that the answer to that is you have to be able to tie it to the fitness of your software in, in like, a very direct concrete, direct way. Like I do think that cons correctness, for example, is, a, um, is an ideology. And you can look at a piece of code and you can add cons in a few places and it does not improve the fitness of the code. Um, so I think, I think it really has to, I don't have all the answers, but I, I, I think that what we have is like a context for thinking about this now at least. So I was, a, I am currently in a project where the first thing we did when we got custody of that piece of software was fix up the cons correctness. And that incredibly improved the business proposition of that piece of software because we got that piece of software into our custody exactly because there was an added requirement that wasn't a requirement before, which was we need to be able to change this quickly. So we are cons. So, uh, so the comment is. And so the first thing we did was we added testing and we added cons. Okay. So the comment is that we took over this project, and the first thing we did was add const, and then we added testing, and it's so much better for adding const. And I'm just gonna say, I don't believe you. Well, I don't think that I don't think that adding const uh, improved the fitness of that software. Now I could be wrong. I'm willing to be wrong, but I I really feel like this is like the ideology talking. I don't think that it improves software fitness. No, the, it improved the software fitness because we needed to change the software quickly and we did not understand most of it because there was so much. And so adding the const 
we improved our ability to reason so much that we were able to do the project much faster. Okay, so, also a factor. so the comment is that by adding cons, we're able to understand the code much faster. Sorry, so don't believe you. All right. One group is does it affect new code negatively? So is that technical step in an API that that forces all the people into this technical step by working around a broken API and stuff like that? For example, if I made a function, I took the cons and long cons, and then I cannot do new cons, a new fu new functionality cons correct, and that technical step has a higher priority for me. Uh, of course, you should not blindly run into it and fix it, but that's a higher priority. A technical step that's slow, kind of like, a, like one function is really like crappy and whatever, but work, it, it, it's a very low priority. So, so that's how, how I, I try to do it. So, so if your technical step for all the code to be, to have tech, new code to have all the technical step, then you should maybe look into that in a higher priority. So uh, the comment is, is that there's a priority, like if there's new code, which potentially could be introducing technical debt by, by not having const correctness, like that would be something to prioritize fixing. So don't get me wrong. Like the code I write, I make sure that it's const correct. <laughs> but, um, but I'm not sure if, how important that is. That's what I'm trying to understand. All right, comment back well, there. It seems like a lot of the minor ones we could, there's, I mean, there's tools that you can use to do these transformations anyway, like the in type to you know, flow range yeah. transformations, all that. You can also do the checking also in uh, automatically using clean tidy or TTP check so that the, they, the developers get it almost immediately the feedback when this thing is happening so that when you're spending time in code review, you're not getting into these, oh, you should make this const or you should make this a full range for you. Instead, you can focus on the larger design. You know. So one comment is that for, for const correctness ideology, <laughs> you could make a program which you know, automatically adds the cons, and potentially you could write tools which do this other kind of thing as well. All right. Me? Yep. Uh, in my company, what we try to do is set up three values in advance. So we talk about values of the software for the customer, values of the software for the company, and values of the software for the developer. And each of them has different values that are competing each other. The developers often want nice, clean code and want to take lots of time to make it. The company wants it done quickly. Mm -hmm. The customers want it to work. So you have all these different values, and then we measure our design up against these values and try to, to measure it in the most fashion. Uh, so the comment was is that uh, uh, in their situation, they have these three values which they measure against. It was customers, customers company, and developers. company, and developers. All right. It seems like you're you're equating um, past value and <clears throat> and current value at, with fitness when fitness has a large component of future value, mm -hmm. right? You, you want the code to be <coughs> fit in the future also, and the future is indefinite. So the value of the future is is far greater than the value of whether or not it works today or in the past. So the cleaning things up ha potentially has an infinite value in the future. Uh, so the comment is that uh, that I'm only focusing on like value in the present and not like in value in the future. Um, and I and I and I definitely don't want to give that impression. So I'm glad that you you mentioned that. So fitness changes over time, and it applies differently over time. You know, you you have a software project that um, let's say it's for a startup company. What fitness means is that you know, your software is able to demonstrate enough to be able to get more venture capital money to be able to continue your business. So in that kind of a context, that kind of fitness, um, you're, you're not gonna care about a lot of stuff. You're gonna take a lot of shortcuts. Uh, that, that would make your software more fit. Um, but if you're also thinking the long term, you know, maybe you decide about how many of these shortcuts you wanna take, or you're gonna pay down the technical debt after you get the funding, uh, that kind of thing, <coughs> definitely. It's 
it does not prevent them to uh, do bad things like we see in the German car industry or Germany with the Boeing. Um, so the business itself will not, will not help you to stay in, in, in the system. Uh, so the comment is, is that regulations come down and like destroy your business. <laughs> so fitness doesn't help there. Um, I'm not really sure anything can help there. Uh, I, I think fitness is probably the best we got. Um, but it, but it, you know, unforeseen events like you know, nuclear bomb blows up your company. Boy, your software is actually pretty fit as it was right there because it's just going to get exploded anyway. You know, interesting thought. All right, coming over here. I don't think a lot of uh, programmers or engineers approach ideologies like this, but maybe we can think of them as uh, heuristics for achieving certain ends. Um, the end you mentioned, for instance, of like doing what is going to generate the most venture capital. Um, it's very hard to know for certain whether certain decisions you make are going to do that. Um, in fact, it might do the opposite because the landscape might change in your, uh, in your product field or something. And what you did before might not work at all. And there could be certain ideologies, maybe not the, the simplistic ones you mentioned, but um, ideologies that you adhere to more rigidly that serve as heuristics for achieving certain ends, most effectively. So the comment is that uh, adhering to certain ideologies like more rigorously might actually end up having a positive impact on your, your ultimate fitness. And I think that's true. Um, I, I think that where we're at as an industry, like the corrective is on focusing less on ideologies. Um, but you know, they're, they do have a place. Like in terms of what exactly their place should ultimately be, I'm not exactly sure. Um, so in terms of the, uh, the ideo ideology stuff, uh, <coughs> a lot of times the issue is that they get taken out of context and that they are taken literally when, you know, the premature optimization thing is something that comes up all the time. Right? Mm -hmm. So the drive principle, for example, like is really at the core of it, the spirit of it is don't repeat complex logic multiple times because you'll, you know, they'll, they'll bit, um, <coughs> start to separate. And it's not really about like verbatim text, don't repeat your text because that doesn't make any sense. We, we, you know, finding shortcuts for, you know, great parentheses and stuff like that. Um, and so, yeah, so I think like ideologies in some sense like give you a framework and they shouldn't necessarily be taken literally, um, it's just they should be understood in terms of their spirit. Um, the other thing is, in, again, again within the ideology thing, like what's, what, one of the things that's really remarkable to me in, in C++ is that is Bjarna and the committee's resistance to garbage collection for like a decade. Right? There was enormous pressure from software, I wasn't writing software at the time, so I don't know, but from what I've heard, there was enormous pressure from, from the public to add garbage collection to C++, and there was resistance from, as far as I can see, it's based on ideology of, I don't think we need it, I think there's a better solution, we believe there's a better solution, it's an ideology that they kind of subscribe to. And so, I feel like at the time, if they were to go with the fitness thing, they would have and garbage collection so that they, they'll get more adoption and things like that. Um, and so I don't know how you really view that specific, specific situation. Like, how do you think that kind of transpired if it wasn't for ideology? Okay, so the first comment is that ideologies should be taken in a little bit more nuanced form. Uh, but I would, I would argue that even if you nuance an ideology, you will still, it can still lead to absurdities, right? I mean, it, it can improve it, so it doesn't happen as, as much, but just keep in mind that it can always lead to absurdities. Um, and the other comment is that C++ doesn't have garbage collection because someone had an ideology that garbage collection is bad. I have, I have, I have no knowledge about this. Like, I have never heard this before. Um, if garbage collection could increase C++'s fitness, maybe it'd be more popular. I don't know. Um, I, I, I can't really comment on that because I, I don't know the context. I was wondering with uh, the other field engineers uh, that you have had, you ask them, how did they come to these best practices that they do in their fields? 
how did those develop? Because we would really like those. They seem like good ideas. Um, they seem expensive and save time in the long run, but that's a really difficult pr proposition to like <coughs> sell it at the beginning, right? Like best practices in the field are not obvious to management. So they clearly managed to convince the management in their particular field. How did they do that? Uh, um, liability, money, uh, failure, risk, cost. They started with audit. Yeah. So. <laughs> so. Regulation is clear. So one one uh, so. To, to repeat your question, like how do how do these engineers in these other fields convince their management to do all this kind of stuff? Like we're going to have such an uphill battle. Um, my experience, because I've worked with uh, uh, some of the managers of these uh, engineers, is that they have an awful lot of confidence in the engineer as an engineer, and so they trust that you know their judgment in these things, and they trust that they know what they're talking about with best practices. Um, how do we achieve that in our fields? I'm not exactly sure. Um, so we're one minute over, so I, I'm, I'm going to take this last question, and that'll be it. This ties into the previous one. Do you ever think there will be a time where our field will be regulated in the same way as medicine and justice is regulated so that it will be a, a legal requirement to have some sort of qualification to practice? Uh, so the question is, do I do I think that we'll ever be regulated as like some other fields, like for example, that you need to have some qualification in order to be able to practice? I think that we already are in certain segments. We do have certain uh, requirements and stuff. It, software is very far-reaching, so I think it highly depends on what you're doing. If you're developing, you know, a triple A game, I would be surprised if there was some kind of regulation for that. Um, so do you want to take the the question after the last question? Okay, quick, quick, quick talk. About it. So the comment, the comment is, is that to practice software engineering in Canada, for instance, you do need to t pass some kind of a test. All right, so that's the end. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Thank you.